Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Chris Thompson. Uh, welcome to Vestibular Training, solutions that will make your head spin. This is my first virtual conference presentation ever, um, and I really appreciate uh, the guys at FAI and uh, the staff um, still allowing this conference to happen and providing us some unique opportunities to provide education to everybody. Um, this information that everybody's gonna share is, is super important and we're happy to be able to still deliver it in some way. So the way that today will work is I'm gonna run this presentation as a pre-recorded session. I will be on the session uh, during the summit live. I'll be on the chat taking questions, etc. And uh, then after the presentation is over, I will uh, come on live and we will do questions and answers and all of that good stuff. So uh, I look forward to seeing you all in person in just a little bit. So let's get to it. All right, so along with my position in the Department of Kinesiology. I'm full-time faculty uh, there at the University of San Francisco. I also own uh, Thompson Fitness Solutions, which is a company that is geared specifically to um, providing fitness and clinical professionals uh, tools, whether it's consulting or actual products, to uh, really help their older adults uh, that they work with live happier and healthier lives. Uh, predominantly through balance training and fall risk reduction, uh, but also we do a lot of other work as well. Um, one of our products is the Mobility Matters online balance training platform. And for being at today's session, I will have a special offer for you guys. So stay tuned for that as it relates to Mobility Matters. Okay, our objectives, we've got a bunch of them today. First of all, we need to understand this complex system, the vestibular system, and how it provides sensory information to the central nervous system and integrates that sensory information along with information coming from the visual system and also to lesser degree from the somatosensory system so that we know that our body can then produce the most effective movement plans and motor programs to keep us safe on our feet and well balanced as we move through life. We'll talk a bit about uh, the age-related changes within the vestibular system and how that affects vestibular function. We'll talk about the elements of a vestibular training program. Um, that's typically called vestibular rehabilitation therapy. Um, and its relationship to other training elements. We cannot think of the vestibular system really only being integrated or only being challenged or trained by these weird head turn and eye shift exercises. We actually have vestibular challenges built into many, many exercises that we do, and they can serve to be very helpful as it relates to improving our overall client's function. Um, additionally, we'll discuss progression and regression strategies. We'll watch some videos and uh, go from there. So let's get started. So first of all, if we just take a look at the functional training model from FAI, um, we kind of see balance and neuromuscular, the green and the gold uh, shaded uh, areas of the model. And typically, that might be just where we draw our attention when we're talking about uh, the vestibular system uh, because it provides sensory input to the central nervous system and the central nervous system then produces motor outputs uh, to muscles um, and joints etc of the body. Um, however, I'm really going to make an argument today that uh, the vestibular system impacts all of these different arms of the functional training model we really cannot get away from the importance of the vestibular system on overall organism function <clears throat> and also how it can be integrated into training all of the different components of fitness that are important for older adults to be trained. So um, the vestibular system truly does have a role in all of these different areas within the functional training model. Now what is balance? 
Balance is a really complex phenomenon. It's a, it's a concept that's tough to wrap our heads around because if you ask somebody, what is balance? I'll say, well, balance is being balanced. Balance is, is not losing our balance. Balance is not falling down. Um, but ultimately, this concept of balance is really tough to define because there's so much that goes into balance and balance is so uh, situation specific. Being balanced in one situation may look a lot different than being balanced in a different situation. Being balanced on skis as you're skiing down a downhill run looks a lot different than being balanced while you're reaching for uh, something uh, at the top shelf of the pantry when you're standing still in, in, in your pantry. So because it's not the same uh, it's, it's not illustrated in the same way in all activities. We really look at balance more from uh, kind of a schematic perspective that we see here. So we see three primary elements that interact with one another to determine whether somebody is balanced in a certain situation or not. So this three-pronged model um, is adapted from the dynamic systems framework, which is a motor control motor learning, motor behavior model. And really, it, it, it's the interaction of the nervous system, the musculoskeletal system, and then the environment, the contextual effects that the body finds itself in. All of those have to uh, basically work well together in order for somebody to be balanced. The nervous system has a lot of sensory information coming in. One of the most important sensory uh, pathways is the vestibular system and the inputs from the vestibular system into the brain to help the body understand and uh, uh, be aware of the movement that's going on in the body, the direction the body is moving, accelerations, decelerations that the body is performing. Um, additionally, we have other uh, sensory systems. We have obviously our vision. We have hearing, we have a somatosensory system, the, the input from touch and pressure receptors in different parts of our body to understand what sorts of surfaces we might be on or what sorts of uh, 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 forces might be impacting our body. Lots of information coming into that element of uh, balance, which is the nervous system inputs. The musculoskeletal system needs to respond to the nervous system's uh, motor plans, the programs that the nervous system comes up with to best deal with the incoming sensory information. So here we have to have activation of muscles, we have to have joints that are stable enough to be able to move effectively through whatever uh, movement patterns are necessary in order to keep our balance. We need range of motion and flexibility to be able to effectively uh, um, displace and change our center of, of pressure so that we can maintain our balance. We have to maintain good posture. And there's so many different elements from the musculoskeletal system that help to predict whether or not we're effective at keeping our balance. And then there are the contextual effects. That's basically the situation the body finds itself in. What's the environment like? What's the support surface like? What's the lighting like? What are the characteristics of the actual task to determine balance? Again, being balanced skiing down a ski slope is a lot different than being balanced holding a yoga pose in a yoga class. So we need to know the task characteristics that need to be performed well in order to maintain balance. And all of these elements will affect one another. So an environment that is more challenging will put more stress on the nervous system, the musculoskeletal system. So let's say that you're walking down the street and you're on this beautiful paved pathway, you're walking along, uh, say, uh, a nice sidewalk in, in a city, but all of a sudden you come on a construction site and now you have to walk across perhaps kind of a, a gravelly or dirty or, or muddy stretch where the environment uh, is much different, the support surface is much different than what you were experiencing as you were walking across 
uh, the, the nice sidewalk. So as the environment changes, then also the challenges to our ability to maintain our balance change as well. As our sensory information coming into the nervous system perhaps gets worse or isn't as substantial, maintaining balance is more difficult. As we lose strength or flexibility or uh, alignment of our posture within our musculoskeletal system, balance becomes more challenged. So deficits in any of these three different areas will affect one another and uh, in the long term affect our ability to keep balance and create some issues with, with fall risk. So what we're gonna focus on today is really the sensory processing and the sensory motor integration side of things on um, as we discuss the vestibular system and what the vestibular system uh, tries to inform our central nervous system about in order for us to do the best we can to keep our balance in uh, movement situations that are monitored and detected by the vestibular system. So let's talk briefly about the vestibular system. We'll dig into a, a bit more after the next slide and its impact on balance and overall function. So really what the vestibular system is, it's structures within the, the inner ear and those structures are, uh, are, are structured, I guess, um, in order to detect acceleration and deceleration in different planes of motion. So we can basically use the vestibular system to let us know when we are moving in the sagittal plane, when our head is moving in the frontal plane, and when our head is moving in the transverse plane. And those, uh, that detection ability of the vestibular system will also then directly uh, interact with what we're doing with our vision. There is a specific reflex called the vestibulo-ocular reflex, which basically says when your head moves and your head turns, it's going to have a reflex response on where your vision goes. If you turn your head to the right, your eyes will also track to the right. So you are looking in the direction that you have turned your head. As your head turns to the left, your eyes track to the left, and you'll be looking in the direction that your head turned. That is the VOR, the vestibulo-ocular reflex. So we're able to determine and uh, be most aware of our environment by having our vision track where our head is turning, and generally that will either be where we are moving now or where we are anticipating moving in the near future. So it's important that our vision actually is able to follow the direction of our head. Additionally, the acceleration and deceleration, whether we're moving our head quickly or slowing it down quickly, moving it slowly or slowing it down slowly, is also information that the vestibular system provides to the central nervous system so that we can best prepare ourselves to maintain our balance in any changeable situation where there might be accelerations or decelerations occurring. Now the issue is, the vestibular system is, along with many other structures in the body, a very complex system. And with a system that is very complex, it's commonplace to have dysfunction occur uh, during the course of the lifespan, particularly as we get older. The vestibular system is very, very, um, a very finely tuned and finely regulated system. And when it begins to be impaired, it creates disharmony with our other sensory systems. Our nervous system, which is creating and, and receiving input, starts to get confused, and there are all sorts of problems that can occur. So there can be a disharmony between the vestibular system, if it's dysfunctional, and our vision. So the vestibular ocular reflex can go awry. And that basically is when you turn your head and perhaps your eyes don't track your head movement or without head movement, your eyes can't fix on an unmoving target. Your eyes are shifting around. This is what we call nystagmus and is really uh, at the root due to vestibular dysfunction and some of the dysfunctions we're gonna talk about in a moment. Um, 
nystagmus as it relates to uh, dizziness in older adults, we oftentimes call vertigo. And vertigo is a situation that can create um, a lot of negative effects. I mean, it can cause somebody to become uh, nauseous and feeling not so great. Um, and it also can lead to a major loss of the ability to maintain balance and can lead directly to falls. So the impairment of the vestibular system is likely to be implicated in increased fall risk. And generally when people have a vestibular system that's not working, ideally, they will choose to uh, stop moving as much. So then that leads to the uh, downward spiral of deconditioning, which in and of itself can reduce or increase the risk of somebody to fall. So we get into kind of a really, really bad pattern. So we want to try to ensure that the vestibular system, which is trainable, can be trained, can be stimulated, and can try to maintain its high level of sensory function and provide the central nervous system with the best information possible. Okay, so let's talk a bit more about how the vestibular system functions as a neural input. So we notice in this uh, little illustration here, the center of the illustration is basically showing us our central nervous system, the spinal cord and the brain, consisting of the cortex, the motor cortex where movement plans are initiated, the cerebellum where we refine movement plans, the brain stem, which basically is the last stop before we send information down to the muscles of the body, and also where we get inputs from both our vision and our vestibular systems. So our vision and our vestibular systems, they work together, they provide input to the central nervous system, uh, essentially via the brain stem, and are integrated with one another as they produce uh, a motor response. So the brain needs to consider the symmetry or the similarities in visual input and vestibular input in order to ensure that it's crafting the most effective outgoing movement plan, what we would consider to be an optimal motor output. So those two systems very important. Then we also, in the periphery of the body, have our somatosensory system. So those are um, nerve receptors in joint capsules in skin, within the muscle spindles that we find within muscle, and that's more monitoring the periphery of the body, what's going on in the joints and the muscles of the body, also providing additional sensory input to the brain, and basically we need kind of a consistent, similar message from the visual system, the vestibular system, and the somatosensory system coming into the central nervous system in order for the central nervous system to make sense of it and then create the most optimal motor outputs. So if something's going wrong with any three of those systems, it likely is going to affect the motor output, the quality of movement, and definitely affect a person's balance and risk of falls. Okay, so let's talk about the structure of the vestibular system itself. Um, and as Mama Thompson, my mom used to say, Christian, you've got rocks in your head. She absolutely was correct. So what we're looking at here is kind of a snail looking uh, uh, structure. That's your cochlea responsible for hearing. But then sort of attached to that is your vestibular system. We have our three semicircular canals. These canals are oriented in the three different planes of motion and fluid, actually it's kind of more like a gel, moves through those uh, canals depending on what plane of motion our head is moving in, particularly what it's accelerating and decelerating in. So we're able to stimulate the vestibular system through motion of fluid or this gel-like substance throughout those semicircular canals. And then at the base of the semicircular canal, we have our utricle and our saculae, and those also consist of uh, fluid and gel-filled uh, structures, which continue to monitor motion of the body. Um, if we take a look at those more closely expanded uh, schematics, we will notice a couple of things. We notice that there is um, these little hair cells. We call them cilia, or hair bundles, 
we notice that there's cilia throughout the lining of all of these structures. And as the fluid or gel moves in response to the movement of the body, it stimulates those hair cells. They almost sway like, uh, like, like reeds or a tree in the wind. They sway back and forth, and the movement of those hair cells helps to inform the central nervous system of what direction the body is moving in, uh, whether it's accelerating or decelerating and those sorts of things. The other thing that attributes to the rocks in your head are the otoconia. We see the otoconia up above the hair bundles on this right-sided um, expansion uh, illustration. And these are just crystals, calcium crystals that are um, also found within this system and can help to regulate and move that fluid through the uh, vestibular system. The problem is occasionally those otoconia can kind of rupture and start falling apart and start kind of getting into the mix of that fluid and start stimulating those hair cells on their own. And that's where dysfunction can begin to happen. So let's talk about some of the age-related changes that we see in the vestibular system. First of all, those hair-like projections, the cilia, similar to the hair on top of our head, we start losing hair inside of our head. So the vestibular system's uh, quantity of hair cells begins to decrease. So the decreased amount of cilia means that we don't detect movement as effectively. We've got less sensory cells than we had before. So we need bigger magnitudes of movement in order to detect motion. So we really don't even recognize that we're moving until far beyond movement has already begun. Um, so that's problematic because it could lead us to perhaps being already too far into a change of our center of pressure uh, that will end up stumbling or even falling before we have a protective uh, mechanism in place where the central nervous system will have a motor plan to help us recover our balance. Additionally, those lost hair-like projections start floating around within the vestibular system and can bump into still functioning hair cells. Well, when something bumps into a hair cell, the hair cell will bend, very similar to how it moves when uh, motion is occurring and the fluid is causing the, the hair cells to uh, bend in one direction or another. So the hair cells themselves that have fallen out can basically inform our body of movement when movement isn't occurring. We're basically getting a tap on our shoulder and that tap on our shoulder, our brain uh, responds to similarly as to if you were walking down the street. So the head motion isn't really occurring, but because those cilia are being stimulated by moving hair cells, we actually start sensing motion when it's not occurring. That's kind of this uh, issue that we know as uh, vertigo. Um, additionally, these ear rocks, right, the otoconia, when those begin to uh, uh, be released into the fluid as well, very similar to the lost cilia, they can bump into functioning hair cells and create a sensation of motion when motion is not occurring. Now this dysfunction occurs in over 30% of people over the age of 70 years old. So it is a very, very common problem, a very common issue, and really is a major factor in uh, balance dysfunction and fall risk in older adults. So what can we do about it? The fortunate thing is it's, it's clear through a number of studies that have been done in different populations over the last couple of decades that vestibular rehabilitation training or vestibular rehabilitation therapy, VRT, is effective at reducing um, or improving the function of the, the vestibular system and reducing kind of the dysfunction that we see with nystagmus and vertigo. Um, these studies have been done on older adults who have long-term vertigo and also younger people who have had concussions. Really, any sort of an insult to the head, the brain, um, can disturb and create challenges with the vestibular system. So uh, athletes who have sustained head injuries or impacts or things like that, 
Um, that can be just as problematic by disturbing the visual ocular reflex and the sensation of motion when motion isn't occurring. It creates as big of a problem in young athletes as it does in older adults. Um, so there have been studies looking at how to rehabilitate both. And generally what we find is that they're rehabilitated in very similar ways, perhaps just at different levels of challenge. So a high caliber athlete who's recovering from a concussion may be doing the same type of vestibular rehabilitation training, just at a higher level of challenge than an older adult who's got vertigo. Now, what types of vestibular rehabilitation training are there? Well, traditionally, there's been habituation, adaptation, and substitution training. So habituation training is basically an ongoing progressive exposure to stimuli that would provoke or produce symptoms until the person becomes, you know, essentially desensitized to that particular problematic um, stimulus. Whereas adaptation, adaptation involves a little bit of a different thing. It, it will actually train parts of the vestibular system that perhaps are not as affected. And it can essentially have the vestibular system take over for its non-functional parts. And then finally, we've got substitution. And substitution is where we may be doing a number of different tracking exercises, diagonal movement, head movement exercises, and eye tracking exercises that are meant to essentially um, make up for whether it's the visual or the vestibular issue that's causing us problems with our balance. And we are trying to enhance the function of them integrating with one another so that we can have less issues with balance going forward. Um, so a lot of the research and some of the exercises that we're going to practice today come out of habituation, adaptation, and substitution. Something that's gaining a lot of traction now in the research is virtual reality. Virtual reality where people are wearing goggles or, or some type of a face mask, um, they create these simulated environments where motion isn't necessarily occurring, but we perceive it's occurring due to uh, the visual um, fields that we see looking through these virtual reality goggles. And what's interesting with virtual reality training, we can really enhance the visual inputs to create very rich visual inputs where uh, we have colors and we perceive motion occurring fast and slow and on a changeable basis. And this really creates kind of a very dynamic environment where the vestibular system and the visual system can essentially relearn how to integrate effectively with one another. Additionally, what's kind of nice, even people who aren't ambulatory, right? People who are not moving through open space, maybe they're in um, uh, a wheelchair or they're, um, they're, they're really not able to move effectively. By wearing virtual reality goggles, they can still get their vestibular system and their visual systems integrated effectively by the perception of motion by wearing virtual reality goggles. So it really helps to provide vestibular training for those who are less ambulatory and less functional, um, where we used to kind of almost feel like, well, if we can't move these people through open space and create some type of a stimulus that they need to habituate to, we're kind of at a loss. Well, we can create, we can artificially create that movement that then habituates their vestibular system to start functioning more effectively. So that's pretty cool. Okay, so what's the mechanism of adaptation going on here? Well, ultimately, really what it comes down to is improving the sensory motor integration of the body and the brain. So we notice down at the bottom of this schematic, our peripheral receptors or somatosensory receptors sending information from muscles, joints, and skin. Visual receptors obviously bring information from the eye. And these vestibular inputs, the movement of cilia in the semicircular canals, the utricle and the saculae, determining motion in different directions, accelerations and decelerations in different directions. All that information gets sent up to the central nervous system, 
which then is responsible for integrating and figuring it all out. And then the motor response is sent out to the musculoskeletal system. And it could be perhaps influenced by previous experience, a previous motor program. So let's say somebody slipped last time they walked through uh, that uh, muddy construction site. They will remember that and perhaps adopt a movement strategy that is different than what they did before because they have learned from trial and error how to more safely negotiate that particular area. So motor experience helps as well. But ultimately, the better the information coming in via these peripheral receptors, the better our brain can formulate a, an effective response. So what is this? This is really an example of neuroplasticity. It's showing us that the brain can adapt. If we provide it better sensory input, the brain will then learn how to provide more effective motor responses that keep our, us balanced and keep our fall uh, risk much, much lower. So it's neuroplasticity. Okay, so let's talk about developing an effective vestibular training exercise program. First of all, as with any type of fitness conditioning, we have to make sure that we meet our clients where they are at, meet our patients where they are at. These are a couple of pictures from my always active classes in San Francisco. We've got a grant where we're at 21 different senior centers, delivering fitness programming and exercise classes, including fall prevention exercise classes to older adults living in San Francisco. On the left, Harry needs a lot more help than Judy and Virginia on the right. Judy and Virginia on the right are doing visual tracking exercises as they're walking through open space without any assistive device. Harry is actually in touch with the wall, holding on to the wall because he's at a lower level of function. We, uh, published results from this study. Um, you can find it on my website's blog. Um, and if you can't find it there, you can always email my, my emails at the end of this presentation. I'm happy to send this information to you. But it was published in the ACSM's translational journal last uh, February. Okay, so our sensory stimulation exercises recognize that, again, our vestibular system can improve if we provide it the right sort of inputs, the right sort of challenge, we can get this sensory system, the sensory organ, to better handle and better um, detect and then send the sensory information into the central nervous system. Uh, visual tracking exercises and also head turning exercises, very, very, very effective. We really should challenge either both vision and vestibular or just vision or vestibular at one time in order to get it all to work better. And we can progress these exercises as well. So recognize we can get these systems to integrate more effectively through doing some uh, very creative and interesting exercises. So let's watch a couple. Here's one sensory stimulation exercise. It could be really effective for us to practice. This is a level five sensory stimulation exercise called turning head from a tandem stance on an unstable surface. It's a very challenging exercise. This yeah, is speeding forward. Up my inner ear, causing it to get a little bit disoriented. At the same time, my vision is helping me maintain my balance. So we just shake up that inner ear. I feel a lot of wobble going on here. Okay, so what we're noticing here, we're in a stationary position. So there's not really any linear acceleration or deceleration, but by turning the head back and forth from side to side, we are creating kind of a rotational acceleration and deceleration that then is detected by the vestibular system and then needs to go to the central nervous system. What we do here to provide a little bit of um, an additional uh, stimulus and a way to maintain our balance is keep our vision fixed straight forward. So we are getting our visual system to really take over the balance maintenance responsibility of this exercise. We're on an unstable surface or so our somatosensory system is challenged, we're turning our heads so our vestibular system is challenged, 
and we're keeping our vision gaze fixed forward so that our vision kind of gets better at helping the others out. So it really helps to assist the vestibular system in maintaining balance. Okay, here's another video. This is an ambulatory video. This is a level two sensory stimulation exercise called shifting eyes forward march with support. Uh-oh, uh-oh, sorry folks. Let's see, there we go. I wanted to go forward here, there we go. Turning around, shifting my eyes, and marching back. I'm using the table as just a point of balance contact. Okay, so this is a more regressed exercise for ambulation. Uh, now we're moving through open space, so we're getting the acceleration and deceleration in the sagittal plane that our vestibular system is picking up on, and but we are creating a situation where through shifting our eyes as we walk, we really reduce the amount our vision is helping us with our balance, so we need to be more reliant on our vestibular system, feeling this acceleration and deceleration of motion, uh, as we're going through open space to help us maintain our balance. So we are creating an environment where we're effectively removing or reducing the effect of uh, sensory input from the eyes and making us have to become more acutely aware of linear acceleration and deceleration of the head um, and of the body through this sagittal plane motion. So it helps us rely more on this vestibular input and pull this vestibular input into the um, uh, motor outputs that will help us with balance maintenance. Okay, so you might think that these are the only types of vestibular training exercises. Well, what's really interesting, guys, is that vestibular function is integrated into all types of balance training. Anytime we have motion of the body and the head, the vestibular system is getting uh, stimulated. So the different elements that we work into our balance training workouts, joint mobility, muscle strength, muscle power, static and dynamic balance, and gait enhancement, the whole kitchen sink that we throw at a person in order to try to improve balance and reduce fall risk, all of those elements have vestibular components to them. So we have to think about all of our training as providing our clients some vestibular stimulation and vestibular challenge. So recognize that we are constantly engaging the system and we can really then pull in even more strategies as we're doing some exercises to challenge the system to a greater degree. So I'm gonna stop share here for a moment and go to a couple of other videos. So here we go, I'm going to Let's see, I'm going to a different screen share, and I'm just going to show you one. We're going to go to this guy, the Tada exercise. Gotta love the Tada exercise, one of my favorites. Okay. And we notice in the Tada exercise, let's see where it is. Sorry, folks. Where is my tada? Here we go. Here's the tada exercise. And we notice here during the tada, I am going through a rotational motion where there's also a vertical component. My head's dropping, my head is raising, my head is rotating from side to side. This exercise is a major vestibular challenge because I've got movement going and acceleration and deceleration going in multiple planes of motion. So just doing a joint mobility exercise is a really, really great way to stimulate our vestibular system. Okay, I'm gonna to go to another exercise now. Let's take a look at our rotating steps to balance. Rotating steps to balance also create a really excellent stimulation to our vestibular system here. Our vision and our vestibular system are needing to respond to the fact that we are turning rotationally 
about 180 degrees, creating a big challenge to maintain our balance. So even a dynamic balance exercise like this has a vestibular challenge associated with it. Let's take a look at a visual challenge or a static balance challenge. Here is a static balance challenge. This is simply a rotating reach. There we go. Rotating, we're multi-directional reach. We're reaching in three different directions at three different heights. Again, anytime you see the head moving, we're recognizing that we are creating a vestibular challenge. So we can up or down the challenge to these exercises by perhaps having the person move their head more quickly or close their eyes or be on an unstable surface while they're doing this exercise to try to ensure that the vestibular input that's coming into the brain is being considered and integrated and utilized most effectively to create the best motor output possible. All right, and then lastly, what I will open up is a, there we go, there we go. Here's our side step to hip drop. This is a gait enhancement exercise. Notice during gait enhancement, again, the lateral motion of the head, which is going to stimulate the vestibular system, and also the vertical vector of the head, stimulating the vestibular system. So all of these areas are being stimulated. Uh, all of these exercises will stimulate the vestibular system. Okay, very good. I'm back to the PowerPoint. And obviously muscle strength, muscle power, vertical vector movements, wood chops, hip hinges, those all create head motion, which then will stimulate the vestibular system. So we can additionally challenge that those via um, some uh, modification of surface, modification of our visual field, or modification of other movements the head might be performing, such as nods or head turns. So if you're interested in all this information, you can go on to the Mobility Matters Balance Training Platform. That's at mobilitymatters.fit. We kind of create what we consider to be precision fitness. Every older adult at USS will get their own customized balance and fall risk reduction training program consisting of joint mobility, sensory stimulation, muscle strength, muscle power, static, dynamic balance, and gait enhancement exercises. As we progress and regress all of these, particularly with uh, attention to sensory stimulation, we need to recognize that we have to match the challenge of the exercise with the level of function of our client at this point in time. So we can have exercises that are stationary, that are moving, that change direction, change the speed of direction, and also adding other challenges as well. So perhaps when we're doing these side steps, we do a hip drop, which also will integrate some lower leg strength. Uh, as we're doing our eye shifts, we can do diagonal high knee stepping, which provides some gait enhancement uh, elements to the exercise as well. So we have ways to progress and regress these exercises so that we can really be specific to whatever level of function we have with any of our clients or patients. I thank you very, very much. We're gonna take time for Q&A now. Recognize, uh, as you see at the bottom here, um, you will get, just for being a part of this presentation, two extra months for free on any annual subscription to Mobility Matters. And I've also developed what's called the Four Weeks to Better Balance Challenge, which has a four-week challenge complete with motivational messaging and educational messaging that you can share with your clients. And um, I'm happy to do that. I've done that with a number of my subscribers. So please go to www.mobilitymatters.fit, email me at chris at mobilitymatters.fit, and let's get started. Thank you very much. And here we go. On to Q&A.